There. Hi, everybody. Hello. Yeah, everyone's in the back all of a sudden. I feel very, very isolated up here in the front of the room. But uh, so be it. We've got we got some Zoomers with us today. Um, hopefully, everybody is safe from the cold and whatnot. So um, I started putting together your second ho second homework today, yesterday actually, and I had hoped to finish it this morning. And then Mother Nature had other plants, and so I played with my son this morning um, instead. So that will hopefully be done tomorrow. Um, I'm debating whether to make it do honestly like as scheduled or to give you two extra days so that it's like two weeks out. Two extra days, would that make your life better? Yeah. You know what? You put your snow boots on and dragged your ass here out of the cold. You win. <laughs> yes, I will take that. Yeah, I'll make it do um, the 26th, and that'll be like a Wednesday so that it's lit. And I'll let you know as soon as it's up. One thing I did get done, though, is uh, formative assessment number two is ready for you. So that's available via ICON. That's the one where you answer the questions. You get graded on completeness. If you could get that done by Monday night, that way I can read it on Tuesday. And let's uh, go over it, make sure that there's no common inconsistencies and things like that. As I was putting together your second homework, though, I realized I had not included an example of something that I'm going to ask you for. So I updated your example one to, to include it. So this is the giant example one that we, I thought we had just finished. Uh, the very last model that's nominal. I am adding, yeah, it is on page 19. I changed this page. I added an example of how you'd ask for a multivariate wall test for the the joint combination of all the predictors in the model in, in theta via test, which refers to referencing the effects of the predictors against zero within each submodel. The same thing happens in SAS via a contrast statement where you only have to list the effects of the predictors and it understands that you mean in both submodels. So this actually works out to be six terms altogether, not just the three that are listed explicitly. So I am going to ask you to do that in your homework. So I wanted to make sure that you had an example. Um, but otherwise, your second homework will be covering uh, ordinal models, ordinal models without proportional odds, and a nominal model. And not a single interaction term this time. I'll give you a break from that. So just logits and odds. Oh, my. So I have the new examples for that in the PDF as well as in the actual files themselves as posted this morning. So, all right. So we have some new stuff to talk about. Not everyone is finished with homework one, so I can't go over that just yet. But if you have any questions about why you missed something, or what you think the right answer should be, please let me know. Um, I will be happy to go over it with you or to check to make sure that my answer key is not broken, as it were. Um, are you ready to talk about some counts? Yeah, you came, right? I mean, you dragged yourself here. Let's talk about counts, baby. Let's talk about you and me. All the good things and the bad things that may be. Counts. <laughs> yes. It counts. Yes. And I'm going to spare you from the Iowa jokes that are obvious when we go here for counts. The whole, yeah, I actually canvassed. I was one of the people, or caucused, whatever. I was one of the people in the gymnasium raising my hand to be counted by hand. I was one of those people. So, yeah, that whole thing. All right, so we have a new, new thing to talk about. So I warned you last time, we have some extra levels of decision making to make in terms of these outcomes that weren't present when we had binary and categorical. So if you have a binary outcome, your distri distribution is burning out. If you have a categorical outcome, your distribution is multinomial, the end. You can think about which link function is relatively most useful in those cases, but that's a different set of decisions. Um, we will have lots of choices to make with respect to distribution when it comes to counts, though. And so that, um, I actually learned some new things reading through um, the Stata book, what, who are the authors on that? Uh, Hardin and Hilby, that's the optional book that's on your list. Um, for those of you especially who are Stata people, I really like that book. Um, even non-Stata people, like the, I like the way they interface 
Um, they teach you how to code like the log, the log likelihood and to show you sort of demonstrate how it works and then they show the output and there's like eight gazillion different Stata models for counts. I had no idea there were so many. Um, the only problem is that they go away once you get to multi-level counts. That's probably why I didn't know about them, but I was going to say I've been using that book a lot, learning some new things, so I'm happy to show them to you. So first, a roadmap. So we're still in the world of general iased linear models, where iased means usually some kind of not normal outcome. Just as a side note, for those of you who've been with me through multi-level models, the extra levels above level one, level two, level three, where the random effects go, those random effects are almost always still assumed to have a multivariate normal distribution. It's the level one conditional part that sw swaps out, just as a side note. But what we've finished with so far is categorical outcomes, broadly construed, binary, nominal, and ordinal. Now where we're at is counts and zero inflated counts. Uh, the next unit is going to include things that are more continuous but potentially bounded, um, such as binomials and continuous things that are skewed. And so that's the next unit. And after we finish all of these, we're going to try to look at multivariate and path model variants of each of these to try and figure out how to do them in a multivariate context. So that's where we're headed. We're already in week four of the semester. Can you believe it? This is week four. I know. Yeah. So taxonomy here then. In terms of distributions that are eligible to be considered, they generally get divided into two kinds, discrete versus continuous. Um, I am often sloppy in my terminology with respect to continuous, but I want to make this point because if you have continuous outcomes, you cannot use discrete distributions. If you have discrete outcomes, you can actually use either. Um, so there's more choices depending on which way you're going about it. Um, counts are considered discrete. So if you have a count of things, it's whole numbers. You can have a zero count, you can't have a negative count, but you can't have a one and a half count. And so the distributions that are eligible for counts go with that idea. Um, it's usually some sort of Poisson or negative binomial flavored distribution. We'll see lots of variants of those. Um, almost always for counts, you're going to want to use a log link. That's a natural log, by the way, not log base 10 or base anything else. The rationale for that is so that it keeps the predicted outcomes above zero. And one of the tricks, in addition to um, extra skewness in the counts, is zeros. You can have no zeros or too many zeros, and that requires extra additions to the model as well. After we get through with counts, then we'll talk about continuous outcomes. And those are outcomes in which the response can be any number. So like one and a half is a valid estimate. In theory, negative 30 is a valid estimate. Um, the most famous continuous distribution that you already know of? Normal. Yeah. Turns out that actually kind of sucks when you think about like the outcomes that we deal with in real life. Like they may be... Um, normally shaped, but in terms of like how far they could possibly go, there's not a lot of outcomes that go to negative infinity or positive infinity. They usually have some sort of boundary. Even if you think of something like response time, it has a boundary at zero. Um, other continuous variables have boundaries because of the limits in the way the variable was measured. You have a floor effect or you have a ceiling effect. So when we get to these, the question will be, are there boundaries, even though it's supposed to be continuous, and how do we address those? And how do we address skewness or lack of symmetry in the distribution? So those will be the questions to be addressed then. But for now, here's your new friend, the log. So same idea. Link functions take conditional means and put them onto a scale that's unbounded. In the case of a count, what we're going to try to predict is the expected count. So I have e to the y here. The log of that, we fit a linear model to. So if I have x on the x-axis here, log y on the y-axis, a slope of 1 is the blue line, a slope of negative 1 is the red line. So the linear model works the same as you would think of. Beta 0 is the expected log of the count when beta 1 is 0. Beta 1 is the change in the log of a count per unit change in x. When you unlog it, when you exp that predicted log count, 
This is what the slopes look like. So the blue line shows a positive slope. The red line shows a negative slope. But either way, it doesn't go past zero. That's what the log does. It keeps the predicted count above zero. And this is it. So there's no like probit, tobit, cumulative, logit, logit. Like, this is it. Yeah. Log base E, yeah, and there's no, I've never seen any other kind of log in this context. It's natural log. So in your programs, it will be either LOG or LN. Like in Excel, it's LN, for instance. So what is this count versus expected count thing? Uh, to be honest, I stumbled over this in the way I talked about it for a number of years, and I am determined to talk about it correctly today. That's a goal, right? Yeah. So... The link. How do we go from the data to what the model says? It's just log. So you'll see this written a whole bunch of different ways. Um, the expected model predicted outcome is uh, on the data scale is usually is given by this mu thing like in your textbook. So I'm trying to follow their notation. So what the model predicts is log count. So when you talk about what is a change in y per unit change in x? It's change in log count. So the y hat that's predicted by the model, that's on log scale. That's known as model scale. To go out of model scale, back down to the data. That's inverse link, which is written as g to the minus 1 here in your textbook. That's exp. So if you e to the log count, you get back to predicted count. Now why do I say predicted count and not count? Because counts are whole numbers. Predicted counts are not. So you can have the mean of a count variable be 4.25. Right? That's totally fine. That's an example of an, an expected or, or conditional count. So if I had predict, the model predict my outcome for on log counts is minus 1, e to that works out to be an expected count, a model predicted count of 0.3. So the thing that it's predicting is not in the count metric where it's only discrete numbers. It's predicting in between them. In the same way that for binary data, we didn't predict 0 or 1. What did we predict? Starts with a P. Probability. Probability. Yeah, that, it's that same idea. Probability is the conditional mean that goes between 0 and 1, even though what we have are zeros and 1s. In count data, what we have is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, but the conditional mean that's being predicted by the model, which you get back, has values that range in between those. So just keep that in mind. Log count, each of that gives you back to the model expected count. Um, one thing that I hadn't understood the, the use of before until I read about it more is something called an offset or an exposure. If you have data in which the length of time in which the count is observed differs across observations, then you need to adjust for that, right? You can either do it explicitly by turning it into a rate, or if you want to keep it in a count metric, there's a variable that you can put in as an option. And depending on your software program, it's either called an offset or an exposure. You put in that variable that has the amount, like the total amount of time, and it goes into the model with a fixed slope of one. So that way it controls for differences in the amount of time under which the count is observed. There's a few other tricks that can be used, um, that can be done using this technique. Um, if you want to put in a, an effect of a predictor where you know what the coefficient should be, you can use it to do this trick. Um, the book had a couple interesting examples, and so I thought it was worth mentioning. Um, in terms of effect size, you already know how to do this. E to the slope it has a new name. It's not an odds ratio. It's an incident rate ratio the exact same way. So if I have an incident rate ratio of 1.25, then I would say that for a one unit change in x, the counts are 25% bigger. If I have an incident rate ratio of 0.75, I would say the counts are 25% lower. And it's the same deal where 1 is the neutral point in IRR, the same as in OR. Negative slopes what can negative slopes be in odds ratio slash IRR land? What, what range do they take? 
0 to 1. And positive slopes go? 1 to infinity. One to infinity. Same story. So just like in um, before when we asked for odds ratios via the word odds ratio, you can type IRR in Stata, for instance. Um, if you wanted to do uh, estimate statements and things like that, it's EXP. So SAS doesn't care. Like, it's like, whatever, it's E to the. You can use whatever word you want to go with that. State is like, no, that's an IRR in the column, or it's an OR in the column. So, whatever. Um, I also looked up what the heck that pseudo R square was that, they, that shows up in some of the count models. Um, it's McFadden's version, which is based on the log likelihood of the model. I did a test with this, trying to figure out if it returns something useful. Um, I fit a model that was an empty model, and I fit a model that had um, completely saturated out the model, so like fixed effects for persons, where there were no degrees of freedom left. Um, the R square wasn't 100, wasn't one, wasn't one. So uh, I would take this pseudo R square thing with a grain of salt as it comes out of the package. It doesn't have a lot of faith. So the log is the log. That's it. Like, that's your choice. Um, the book walks through a couple of other things, but the reason that none of them make sense is because the log is the only thing that keeps the predicted count positive. That's its job. So all the choices that go from this point out have to do with the distribution of the variable, not the link. Cool? Okay, with me so far? All right. So here's your choices. Poisson. This is the most restricted one. Um, I've never seen it fit in practice, ever. So take that with a grain of salt. Here's the probability density function for this. It's a discrete distribution. The reason that it never fits in practice is that it only has one parameter. It's the parameter is named lambda, and that's supposed to be the mean and the variance. So if you have a distribution where the mean is one, that's this yellow set of dots here, the variance is supposed to be one. Uh, the Poisson distribution only takes uh, values of zero or greater. If you have a distribution with a mean of four, the variance is four, that's the purple line. The reason that this has dots is because it's discrete. So it's, it's drawing connected lines, but in reality, there is no uh, area between the dots. Like it's discrete, just like that's the values that it takes on. I learned this. Um, thank you, Jonathan, if you're listening. I'm sure you're not because you're working at Hy-Vee while our son has a babysitter. But Y factorial is the same thing as this hangman looking thing, which is named gamma of Y plus one. Now, why I care about this is because I was reading across different sources about these models, and some of them put this in here, and some of them put Y factorial. And I was like, these have to be related. He's looking at like, oh yeah, yeah, that's the same. Great, thank you math people. So when you find the way that these models are parameterized, you will see this thing show up sometimes or Y factorial show up sometimes. But do you need to memorize this formula in your life? No! The thing that I want you to memorize is that the Poisson has one parameter. The mean is the variance. So if you have a mean that's anywhere above like one here, it doesn't anticipate very much skewness. And that's not often the case for counts. So there's three ways that that one type of distribution can be inadequate. One is if the mean is different than the variance. Um, this idea of having too much or too little variance is called dispersion. It goes back to uh, basic intro stat. You have measures of central tendency, you have measures of dispersion, right? Where that's like standard deviation, variance, and into a quartile range. So if you don't have enough variance, if the variance is smaller than the mean, that's under dispersion. If you have too much, it's over dispersion. That's the far more common one. So let's fix just that one for right now. The most common fix to that is to add something to the Poisson that allows the variance to exceed the mean. And it works out that the negative binomial distribution can be used for this purpose. Originally, negative binomial describes the opposite of binomial. It's like the numbers of failures out of the number total, something like that. That sound familiar? Yeah, I, I, 
I don't know. I've never actually done it in my life. I'm sure I did it in some intro stats class where they talk about pulling balls out of an urn or some shit like that, <laughs> but I've never actually done it. But the, ver the version of negative binomial that I'm familiar with is this magical little thing K here. Um, it's called alpha in some of the textbooks. It's called K in some of the others. Since alpha is already related to type one error rate, I picked K. Because K is up for grabs, right? What's K? K is now a dispersion parameter. That's what it is. So what it does is create over dispersion, extra variance that increases as the mean increases. So the variance is now a quadratic function of the mean. So it's a multiplicative factor. There's actually two flavors of negative binomial. There's an additive variance factor and there's multiplicative. Multiplicative usually makes more sense. So if k is zero, you're back to Poisson. So you can do a model comparison to decide if k is significantly different than zero to be able to add this extra stretchy part. Um, there's also a related distribution called the generalized Poisson that solves the technicality that the likelihood is undefined if k is zero. Um, I have never seen this except in textbooks. It doesn't extend to multi-level models either, but negative binomial does. So I made you a picture to show you what this distribution would look like. This is one of the few times I made my very own picture. Very proud of that. So the blue line versus the red line. They each have a mean of five. But whereas the blue line fo follows Poisson, where the variance is also five, the red line has an extra K stretchy factor of 0.25. So it creates an expected variance of 11.25 instead. Uh, same thing with green versus purple. The mean is 10 in both cases, but purple has a stretchy. So this basic sheep, where you have a, a lot of people at the low end and then the, a big tail, that's very common for count data. Whether or not you need your K, whether or not you have this extra stretchy uh, multiplicative thing, that's a likelihood ratio test. A, model, a nested model comparison. And so we'll get to do those for the first time as well. So, sure. So, Let me open another picture here while you're going. Go ahead. Is the negative binomial like a version of the Poisson? Nope. It, the Poisson is a special case if K is zero. Like then they, they, they oh, reduce okay. to be the same thing. Okay. Um, there's an extensive discussion of this in the Hardman Hilby book. They present like three different ways to think about it. Um, but it's, it's a, the negative binomial is a mixture of distributions where one is Poisson and then there's like a gamma part that controls the distribution of the stretchiness. So they're, they're sort of related, but negative binomial adds stuff to Poisson, would be, multiplies stuff actually, but that, that would be the way to think about it. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And it tested against zero for you. So you have some evidence as to what the shape should look like. So I want to stop right here and tell you a story. Can I tell you a story? True story. This is the basis of example two. This story has a happy ending. So um, this is back in my days at Nebraska where I was the only quantitative person in the entire psychology department. There was one other faculty member who taught all of the undergraduate stats classes, of which there were three, and the first year sequence, of which there were two, and I taught everything else, and I had consulting hours. And so I answered a lot of questions, and there were days I literally couldn't even go to the bathroom without someone trailing me to talk about their data. But one of my favorite stories from that era is this one. Um, one of the graduate students is working on her master's thesis. And the question that she came to ask me, let me show you a picture. This is her variable. She did an experimental study of couples where um, there were, they introduced some sort of um, argument or like thing to make them irritated with each other. <laughs> There were three different ways of dealing with that irritation where they manipulated that between groups. And the DV was the number of mean things said during a subsequent exchange. Number of aggressive verbalizations. That's the distribution. Hmm. 
So, 45% of the people said no mean things, all the way up to some asshole who said 24. <laughs> you know what her question was? What's the best transformation I should use to make this more normal? What's my answer? You don't have to. Um, I wasn't that polite at first. <laughs> um, I channeled my, my inner uh, butthead and Beavis, and I was like, um, no. <laughs> no, 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 I don't think so. I have 45% of the cases that have the same number. What mathematical transformation is going to take that one number and somehow split it apart? There isn't one. These people are all the same. I don't know how to split them. Um, yeah, you could call this positively skewed. You could quibble with how many outliers there are. So let's do some sort of outlier analysis, and I'm guessing that maybe person 14 here, two people said 17 mean things. One person like, where's the outlier start, do you think? I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's very squishy, right? <laughs> Like, there's no hard and fast rules, even if you use cutoffs and things. But, but more to the point, like, if one of the manipulations was to make someone angry, it worked. Like, why would you want to get rid of this person who said 24 mean things? Like, that's helping your cause. So, no, you don't want to get rid of anybody. Um, you don't want to reel in the tail because you're squishing people together who distributed themselves differently. Um, what you want to do is pick a new model. That's what you want to do. She had only been through first year stat sequence where everything had to be normal or else. So I was like, uh, there's, there's models for that. Let me help you. And I'll get foreshadow what happened. We did the normal model and the interaction that was supposed to be the main point of her master's thesis had a p-value of 0.06. I suspect that is why I got involved. <laughs> After fitting a Poisson type model that fit better, dun, 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 less than 0.001. See, it had a happy ending. And an even happier ending for this particular student who became one of maybe three people that I know of whose master's thesis was actually published. That never happens. My master's thesis was a total piece of crap that was rejected without review from like three journals. So to get it published is non-trivial. So good job, Rosie Maldonado. She got her PhD a few years later and she's out in the world. So this is a true story for today's example based on real data. And I wrote up the results section that goes with this particular example because I ended up throwing in um, several things that weren't in the paper that I've learned since then. Um, but if you want to see what the paper actually looks like, I have it linked to it right here. So there's me. See, that's what that's what I get for being harassed on the way to the bathroom, right? I get third authorship. Not that she did that, but I'm just saying, you know, you help enough people, you get your names on stuff because you help them write it up and you feel good. And I feel good that I was able to help her. But yeah, there's a model for that. That's where we're going with this. Not everything has to be normal. So her data are going to be fit best, foreshadowing again by the stretchy Poisson. Even though it looks like she has too many zeros, the model is going to account for that, but we'll get there. Okay, how are we doing so far? Ah, what a great question. There's an app for that. Yeah. So. I want to talk about words and fit for a moment because these are things that get thrown around and it's easy to get confused. So you could describe what we're going to do as a nonlinear model, but that phrase is actually not helpful. If you hear the word nonlinear, you could be talking about a type of model, like everything that we're doing is actually a linear model because it's slope times variable plus slope times variable. The link is put in to ensure that it stays that way. A nonlinear model um, 
it would be something else where there's like exponents and stuff like that in it. You can also say that we have nonlinear slopes. So like if I put in a quadratic slope, that creates a nonlinear pattern of relationship, even though it's still in the linear form. Or you could say that we're doing a nonlinear regression. Because you know the phrase linear regression, right? That usually means normal outcome. It doesn't necessarily mean that all the effects are linear in the model. So nonlinear regression could mean that too. So nonlinear as a phrase is not actually that helpful. Likewise, another word that gets thrown around is fit. And I have been guilty of throwing this word around imprecisely as well, and I want to fix that. Um, it is often used to refer to predictive model quality. Predictive quality, that's not fit. That's effect size. If you have a good R square, that is not fit. It's prediction. Fit means one of two things. When we get to multivariate models, fit is going to refer to the extent of the match between a covariance matrix or cross tabulation that occurs in the data versus the one that is predicted by the model. That's where fit is going to mean. It says nothing to do with how good your model is at predicting it. It just has to match the pattern of covariance or cross tabulation. What we're going to do to decide whether or not negative binomial is good or good enough is distribution fit. And it turns out that there is a way to assess that. You just have to know how to ask for it in your software packages. So we can look at both relative fit and absolute fit to decide which distribution is going to be appropriate. Relative fit is when you take one model and compare it to the other. So we can ask, does negative binomial fit better than Poisson? That's asking, do we need this K stretchy dispersion factor to be something other than zero? Because if it's zero, it's Poisson. But how do we know if it's good enough? Now back to your question, Kelly. Like, okay, it looks like this data set, let me see here, this picture, I'm going to tell you what happened. Negative binomial fits this one best. Does that look surprising? I, I was surprised because I was expecting this giant pile of zeros to cause a problem. But there's a test for that. So how do we know if there are too many zeros, if it exceeds what they're supposed to be a negative binomial? We have to find some way of assessing absolute distribution fit. And there is a stat for that that gets reported by these generalized modeling programs which also can tell you if something is normal or not, by the way. So that can help in deciding whether or not you even need a generalized linear model. It's reported as Pearson chi-square over degrees of freedom. One means you have good fit. That's what the goal is. I spent a while over the last week trying to really understand this, trying to like program it and get the same numbers out of the software. And once I was able to do that, I felt really good about myself. I feel like I get it now. What it is, is basically the numerator of variance. It's each observation minus the predicted version from the model. So if y is a count, this is the predicted count. So it's the unlogged version so that they're on the same metric. Because you can't take a count minus a log count and have that make sense. The denominator is the standard deviation that's predicted by the model at that expected count. So at that expected count is the key, because in these distributions, if you have something that's other than Poisson, the expected variance increases with the expected count. The variance is bigger as the count gets bigger. It's a different variance at each point. It's heterogeneity of variance on purpose. So you have to condition it on, go back to this, the standard deviation at that point. So what this boils down to is the sum over persons of the data average standard deviation, like how far off is each observation from the mean sort of on average, versus what does the model say it was supposed to have been. So we're talking about a match here. If it's greater than one, the data show more variation than it's supposed to have. That's bad. So we get this statistic for generalized models um, out of SAS, gives it from GenMod or Glimix. Glimix is what I've been using most of the time. Instata via GLM, which is going to be a new one. 
um, possibly in others, but I haven't investigated everything that STATA has to give. Um, and just as, as an example of an extension to this that I didn't even know of, it is possible to see whether or not the stretchy factor, the K thing, actually itself needs a linear model, differs across people, <sighs> right? Like you could predict heterogeneity of variance, not just let it be there. You can do that in normal models too, and I hope I get a do example of that later in the semester, but that's one example in which this statistic will start to go away whenever you have a different expected variance for each kind of person. But most of the time, that's not the case, and you'll be able to look at this as some sort of indicator of, of distribution fit. Okay. Let's look at an example. Hmm? No, I'd never heard of it before I read it in the book. But I thought it was cool. Because there's two ways to look at variance problems, right? Like over dispersion, like as something to be fixed or as something to be explained. Like why, yeah, why is it that the variance is um, heterogeneous? Well, is it just a function of the count increasing or is there more to it? Are there pockets of people that are more or less homogenous? If there are, then people need their different case as a function of, of predictors. So it is possible to allow heterogeneity of variance to be predicted itself by a linear model. You just have to know how to ask for it in software. I know how to do it in normal. This is the first time I had seen it in anything beyond not normal, the, this thing. So he, he, they called it a generalized negative binomial with heterogeneous variance. So cool, as I said. Yes, question? It's whichever one you say it is. So if, if you're saying it's normal, you actually don't need the denominator because everybody has the same standard deviation. There's only one. If you say it's Poisson, then the standard deviation at y hat is y hat. The mean and the variance are the same. If you say it's negative binomial, it's whatever the mean is plus stretchy times mean squared. So it's whatever the model says is the idea. And so you have what really happened on top. You have what was supposed to happen on the bottom. And the question is, how well do they match? If they match, this thing is one. It depends on the model. So it's, it's a way to examine the absolute fit of the data residuals to the model that they're supposed to follow. Yes. Super useful, I thought. So let's see. Let's see Rosie's story, shall we? And then we'll talk about extra zeros. I promise. Because extra zeros turn out to be a little bit painful to deal with sometimes. So these are real data, as I said. They have um, one manipulated variable. They told participants to use a certain emotional regulation strategy. So this is out of clinical psych. Um, a lab that examines um, interpartner violence and things like that. No, no strategy. A cognitive reappraisal, which is like a good thing to do, like make it like better in your head. I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm sorry. I can't even pretend. Um, or suppression. You know what that one means, right? Shove it down. Just I'm not angry. I'm fine. Like that's suppression. Turns out that one's not good for you. Um, and then they have a sample of people either with or without a history of intimate partner violence. Um, by the way, reviewer three wanted us to call this intimate partner aggression in the manuscript, and so we did. So they were like, fine, it's IPA then. But IPA sounds like a beer. So I'm sticking with IPV. What? That's what they call IPV. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell that to reviewer three. So. Um, well, they had a questionnaire about their, this is from their history. So, yeah, like what, what happened in the experiment was like done to different kinds of people. And so this was whether or not they had a history of IPA or IPV something. So this was planned as a two by three between groups and COBA. That language mean anything to you? Analysis of covariance. That means you have two categorical variables 
that sort of by default in this language have an interaction between them. Uh, the idea is that the coping strategies should differ more as a function of your history, like that was sort of the idea. Um, ANCOVA, the C part, stands for covariate. A covariate is a term for a predictor that someone else cares about who's not you. It's something you have to put in the model, usually not within any interaction terms, although I insisted that she check all those to do our due diligence. Um, their amount of aggressive verbalizations in a neutral condition, so sort of controlling for like general asshole tendencies as the covariate. Um, that predictor didn't ever matter, but it's left in here so that reviewer key three can't argue about it. Um, and then the final model in their paper has a slightly different sample size for reasons I honestly don't remember. And they included gender again because reviewer three insisted. So it's very much close to the paper, but not exactly. So that's was, that was what she planned to do. And that is exactly what we did with one thing different. We swapped out for a normal residual distribution, some sort of count distribution. And rather than predicting the number of aggressive verbalizations, we predicted the log of the number through the link so that the predicted number stayed positive. Otherwise, you can think of it with that sort of two by three design language of main effects and interaction terms. It's the same in terms of the linear model aspect of it. So I have a couple different routines in here. Um, Stata, I'm using univariate routines because the multivariate versions, the multi-level versions didn't give me distribution fit, whereas Sask Lumixes did, so I use those. And again, they differ in whether they use denominator degrees of freedom, Stata does not, Sask Lumix does. So here are the data manipulation and description steps. So I have a variable called ER condition, where one is gonna be none, two is cognitive reappraisal, three is suppression. And do you know why I am attaching the number inside my label? Do you remember what, did I tell you about this? I think I did, just to reiterate. Hmm? For later on? Well, I could just put the label, but what happens inside SAS, and I don't know if Stata does this or not, but SAS will print these in the order that they are in the alphabet it rearranges them. So it would put cognitive appraisal first and everything, and then neutral, and then suppression. And that drives me crazy. So I put the number in the label to keep them in the order in which I want them. So, so I did that in Stata up here, asking it to tabulate, summarize, etc., and then doing the same thing in SAS. So just labeling variables. Um, we're treating intimate partner violence as a as a continuous variable since it's binary that simplifies some of the coding of the interaction terms as well and then whether or not they were aggressive during the neutral condition because so few people were this is also a binary variable all right so here's some descriptive stuff so picture time that's the picture of the means across the conditions where the blue line is for the people without a history of ipv the red line is for the people with a history and I want to point out where the lines end. You see the y-axis here? Here's zero. So there was one group here that had a count of 0.017 on average. So it was damn near a constant. So trying to keep the predicted counts above zero is gonna be really important to make sure that that group gets predicted accurately. Do, if you just stared at these lines, does this look like an interaction to you? I think so. It looks like there's a bigger difference in IPV in the suppression condition than in the others. Possibly even a backwards difference between suppression and cognitive reappraisal. If I'm just making my, my eyeball visualizations here. Here's the distribution of the overall variable across all groups. It looks really what's known as zero inflated, meaning a whole lot of zeros in this pile. It's definitely skewed positively. If I subset into the six different groups, here's the distribution within each group. So I'm doing this to try to show 
what the residuals would look like after we control for group, it, what's going to happen is that the model is going to handle, predict, account for all of the zero inflation. We know why there's so many zeros. They're from the people who are told to cognitively reappraise their situation. So this is another example of how you can't always tell just from looking at the marginal distribution of the variable what distribution is going to fit. Because what you need to fit is the conditional distribution. It's the distribution that's left over after your predictors do their work. And you won't know that until you have predictors. But I can look at the residuals within a group and say, okay, I know for sure one thing, <laughs> that ain't normal. And there is no transformation that I can do to make it normal. So I'm not going to do that. But just to show you what happens if you ignore the fact that that ain't normal, here's my linear model. <laughs> so e to the agger. So the expected, the, the expected count, all right? So I am predicting the raw count. This is an ANCOVA between groups. I've set it up so that my reference group is actually the suppression group because that's what happens in SAS when you put in a categorical predictor. The highest category is the reference. In STATA, I changed it to match so that the output would be consistent. So I have a covariate of whether they were aggressive in the neutral condition, the simple main effect of IPV, the simple main effects of group, so suppression versus each of the others, and then the interaction term. I'm using the Chidi syntax in Stata, uh, hashtag, hashtag. Remember what that does? It has not only the interaction, but also, hmm? No, you're smiling. You should be happy about this. Tell me why you're so happy. You can't remember? But you remember a little bit. Subconsciously, you remember because you would not be that happy otherwise. What is this doing for me? Yes, it, it's, this is the two-way interaction and the main effects in one shot. So it saves you typing. That's why you should be happy. Uh, the analog in SAS, um, I ended up writing it out, but I could have done this at 2. So I am using something called GLM in STATA. That stands for generalized linear model. Even though GLM to me stands for general linear model, but whatever. Um, this is, what does link identity and family Gaussian suggest to you? What kind of model is this? And feel free to read from the screen. Normal. Gaussian means normal. Hmm? You heard that before? Gauss is like a person, right? Yet another old white guy that names something after himself in statistics. That's a thing. I've never invented anything, but if I do, it's going to be called the Hoffman something, you know, just, just because. We got, um, oh, we got somebody joining us. Oh, no, she got booted. Okay, come back, Casey. There we go. So, yeah, GLM is like Glimix in that it does a whole bunch of different flavors of models. You have to tell it the link and the distribution that you want to work with. Um, rather than distribution, it says family, which, okay. Um, I'm asking for ICC, uh, inter nope, other class. Information criteria, AIC and BIC, in the same scale as SAS. Um, unlike some of the other routines in STATA, you do not get a wall test for the significance of your model by default. You have to ask for it. So this is how I asked for it. I am listing out all of the slopes in the model and setting each to be zero, and then asking for test as a joint test of whether all of these things are zero simultaneously. So this is the analog of the F test for your R square in a regression, except that it's chi square instead of F because there's no denominator degrees of freedom. 
So for the variables that are being treated as continuous, c dot, I'm saying explicitly, what if their slopes were zero? That's what I want to test. For the variables that are i dot, that's categorical, where it's doing the coding scheme, that phrase right there, that says, what if the mean for group one was equal to the mean for group two and the mean for group one was equal to the mean for group three? That's a roundabout way of saying no mean differences or slopes equal zero. It's the same idea. Question? So if you have like a categorical variable with like 15, yes. Like what if the mean for group one is equal to the mean for group two and the mean for group three? Yes. You got to type a lot. Yeah, type, type a lot. <laughs> okay. Um, I have one more Yeah, um, it's hard to explain, but I think some of it relates to timing. So like Logit has probably been around much longer than GLM. Proc Logistic has been around a lot longer than like GenMod or Glimix. And so what you can do with each one, there, there's a lot of overlap. But then there's some idiosyncrasies. So for instance, if we used GLM to do the same logit models as before, it doesn't spit out like this wall test automatically. It doesn't uh, doesn't spit out distribution fit. It doesn't spit out like certain things that are sort of more general. Um, the converse of that is also true. So I'm going to switch from GLM to NB reg to get an actual test and estimate of the scale factor, the K factor, because that doesn't show up explicitly in GLM, but it does in NB reg. So no one's ever pulling this at all. No. No, you, you have to sort of dig through the manual and see what it gives you and where else you can get it. And that's where the Google is very helpful in trying to figure this out. But the same thing is true in SAS. Like Glimix has things incorporated in it that the others don't, even though they could have because it's newer. So job security, figuring all this out and figuring it out and keeping it current. You know, there's a phrase that some of my colleagues like to leave where you say your course is prepped. Do any of you, any of you teach yet? No, you will hear this phrase. Once you make a new class, they'll say, oh, you've prepped it before. Like it's just in a box and you get it out of the box and you bring it and then you give your lecture and you put it back in the box. Every time I teach this stuff, they change the software. There's updated things that you can do, things you can't do. They change defaults, like it's never prepped. So if you ever find yourself teaching stats, just be, be ready to accept that. It's never really prepped. <laughs> You know what? I don't trust the Google um, unless I can verify it. Trust, but um, what's that phrase? Trust, but verify, like for your kids. Oh, yeah. yeah, so like I'll find code and they'll be like, this is how you do this. And so I'll take the code and see if the answers indeed match like what it should be, usually across programs, because then it's like so converging evidence. <laughs> Um, I guess what I'm getting at. Like, I found code and I ran it. Like, yeah. I don't know. Uh, two options. One is to find a generic routine that lets you write out the model your way, where you know exactly what everything should mean. That is um, NL mixed, and then there's something in Stata that does it that I forget what it's called. The other is to make up data. Okay. Make up data where you know what the right answers is, and then. Put, run it through the code and see if you get it back. If you make up a data set with like 10,000 people, right, then the answer should match like spot on. So yeah, I, I do that kind of thing even to check my math and my understanding of concepts. Like I feel like if I can calculate it or make it happen in a data set, then I know what I'm doing. So. Yeah, Google University is, is nice for starting things, but trust but verify, definitely. All right, where was I? I'm off on a tangent today. And this is placebo do too. Like, I've already had my coffee from this morning. I think it's because I'm so happy to see you guys. <laughs> There's no school today. And I thought, I didn't know what was gonna happen because my husband's working on a grant proposal that's going in next week. And I was like, oh, please let me find a babysitter. Please let me find a babysitter, yes. So thank you, babysitter Mackenzie, playing with Huey at home. I was able to come and do this, be with you guys today, so. He likes babysitters. The last time he had one, he told me, Mommy, go back to work. I'm not done yet. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Uh, yeah. So more stuff that doesn't show up by default. Contrast is how you put the multi-degree of freedom tests back together again. 
Um, so for instance, like these two things together make up the simple main effective group. It takes two contrasts to get it. That's what this does, is give you a two degree of freedom test of whether there are those two differences together are significant. Same thing with this interaction term. So contrast does that. Um, that happens by default in SAS Linux, so we don't have to ask for that one. Margins is how we get uh, cell means for each. Then we have simple effects. Um, I wrote these out the long way because I, I found it was more transparent. Um, this is for particular groups. So for instance, the difference between uh, no strategy and cognitive reappraisal if you have no IPV history. So that's the difference between uh, group one and group two with the interaction term set to zero because that's IPV zero. So the first three lines have the second two terms set to zero. The second three lines, second set, have those terms uh, multiplication of whatever happened in the first part. So there's one versus two, one versus three, two versus three. When you multiply those by one, it just brings the values over here. Likewise, you can get the simple effects of IPB per condition. So this is whether or not there's a difference between the no and yes groups for each of the conditions. And then last but not least, the interaction contrasts, whether there are differences in the differences. So we'll go through all of those things. But this is the part that typical ANOVA output does not include. It gives you usually this much. It gives you F tests for the main effect and some sort of global interaction contrast, and it doesn't tell you anything about how to interpret the interaction. So asking for what are the simple effects and simple effect differences can help you actually figure out whether or not um, where the interaction is, so to speak, how to decompose it. Uh, same thing in SAS. So neutral covariates are two predictors. Um, model equals link equals identity, dist equals normal. So that's the same analog. We're just doing a traditional ANCOVA. Um, the wall test for the R, R square of the model. In this case, we are explicitly giving the values to each of the groups. So this is a contrast representing none versus cognitive reappraisal. And then the second one is none versus suppression. So putting those together gives you the main effective group. Same thing with the interaction with IPV that's being treated as a continuous predictor. Um, LS means with I link. Can you guess what those are going to give us? And don't say logits. Logits are done for right now. Uh, these are LS means, so these are predicted outcomes. What's I link going to give us? What's our link this time? Or actually, in this case, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me change my answer. What's I link going to give us in this model? That's where I was going to go with this. Sort of a trick question. It's just normal regression. So what's the inverse link of an identity link? Yeah, there, there is no I-link. Model scale and data scale are the same. So doing that to, to make a point, like part of the reason why this model is going to be broken is that it does nothing to ensure that the predicted counts are positive. You're just predicting them as is. Uh, estimate statements then to get the simple effects. These are the uh, strategy group differences as a function of whether or not someone has IPV. So again, the first three lines give you strategy group differences where the zeros are for the interaction term because that's when IPV is zero. The second set of lines gives you uh, the echoing of the, the values because IPV is one. Then we have the IPV effects for each group. And then last but not least, the interaction contrasts. So here's what we find. SAS output to start with, although the files for everything, if you want to look at the full state output, are available online. So here's our first instance of our new favorite absolute fit stat. Pearson chi-square over degrees of freedom. It's 11. That's pretty bad. 
It's supposed to be one. 11 is not one. Last I checked. Um, I looked to see if there was any way to turn this into a significance test. I didn't see one. Um, no one in the book used it that way. It looks to be somewhat heuristic. Um, but 11 is not one. That, I can tell you that. So this model doesn't fit. This is a way to help you decide in practice whether or not you even need a generalized linear model, right? Is normal good enough? Well, I don't know, is 11 good enough? No, but we'll go through it anyway to see some of the problems. So in terms of the output, the residual variance that's usually given in a separate table shows up here in the list of parameter estimates. It's called scale. That's always what any kind of variance related term is called in the output. You have to know what you've asked for to interpret what it is. And in this case, I ran the same model in traditional ANOVA software to make sure that indeed, yes, the residual variance is 11.18. The solution for fixed effects gives us the actual model parameters. I've labeled these for you but it will be more useful to actually look at the simple effects that we requested that these betas that, that are created by the betas because that directly answers the question of group differences. Here's our traditional ANOVA output. So it doesn't look like there's a, any effect of neutral as a covariate. Um, this is the difference in IPV on average across ER conditions. This is the two degree of freedom test across the conditions for strategy, conditional and IPV zero. And then this is the interaction term. As I said, I think the reason I got involved. Overall, the model does account for significant variance. There's my chi-square for that. And here's my means. And I wanted to point out something interesting in the means. So I asked for estimated means per the condition, holding neutral at zero. Here are the counts. So on average, for instance, somebody in group one without a history of IPV has an average of 2.6 mean things said. Here's my standard error for that. And here's my alpha and here's my confidence interval. Cool, right? So far, so good. What about this group? What about the confidence interval? Can you have a negative mean thing said? Is that a nice thing? I think so, but they didn't measure it that way. Yeah, no. So we know that that standard error can't be right. Either that or we can't have a symmetric distribution where it's two standard errors on either side of the mean. Can't be right because it's predicting things that are impossible. And this is from the normal. This is from the normal, yep. And the normal says that these standard errors, the only thing that makes them differ from each other is the sample size in each of these groups. They're based on the idea that the model has one residual variance and that residual variance is 11. It's unrelated to the mean. That's what the model says. And here's another example of this, negative count of 1.4 in this group. Because we're using identity link, the model predicted counts are the same as the I-link predicted counts, and so we have the same problems. So here are the simple effects. We will not interpret these for right now because the model doesn't fit. Here are the residuals, and here's more evidence that normal doesn't work for these residuals. So let's fix it. Our new friend, log link and Poisson. Log on the front. E is not is gone from the equation. So it's the same what's known as a linear predictor. It's the same linear model. It's the same seven fixed effects, one intercept, six slopes. But what they're doing now is predicting the log of the expected count rather than the expected count directly. And we're not saying there's E here that has one variance. 
we're saying that the variance is whatever the mean is supposed to be at that point. So the variance and the mean grow together. Let's play Where's Waldo and find the differences in the code. What did I fix in Stata first to make this a generalized linear model with a log link and a Poisson distribution? There it is. That's it. There's only one other thing that you have to watch for. Margins. Margins is how you get predicted outcomes. But are they data scale outcomes or model scale outcomes? In this context, are they counts or log counts? Yeah, depends on which line. That's why there's four lines here. The default is the iLink version, data scale, actual counts. If you want what the model says the outcome should be for each kind of person, you add the term predict XB. So when we have a regular old ANCOVA, with an identity link and a normal distribution, there's only one set of lines that you need. There is no model scale versus data scale. This predict XB, that's log count. Otherwise, it's count count. These commands right here, do you see anything different about them? Nope. They are literally copied and pasted. Now, why can I do that? Because the model's the same. How the slopes work together to create predicted outcomes, simple effects, conditional on each interacting variable, and interaction contrast is exactly the same. All of these values, though, are going to be spit out in model scale, which is in log count. So this is the difference in log count. It's the difference in the difference in log count. Log count, log count, log count. And if you want effect sizes, here's something else I had to figure out the hard way. It's not IRR in GLM, it's E form. Like the, the E form, E to the form. That's what that means. But if you want to do it on Lincom, it's not E form. It's IRR. Do you know how I figured this out? Uh, error messages and tried the other one until I got it to work. That's how. And then back to E form on contrast, just because. So some combination of either E form or IRR gives you the exponentiated version of these things. So I have um, both sets of output in here because it looks a little bit different. This is what GLM looks like. Note that it does something very helpful. It reminds you what you've asked for. You just have to know what this means. So it's saying G of U, G is your link function, so how do you get your predicted outcome? It's the log of it, where mu is the predicted outcome in the data scale. And then what is the variance of the predicted outcome? It's the mean. So this is Stata's way of saying, Poisson. It puts it in brackets. And log. We have this thing right here, that's our Pearson test of fit. It's down from 11 to 4. Much better. But still not good enough. By the way, it gives you these two things. I, f I have no idea what the hell they are. They're new. They're not the usual AIC and BIC. There's some other thing. And I clicked on them, and it brought up a whole page of extra description, and I was like, nope, someone else can figure that out. 
Log likelihood, that's the same thing as usual. You'll have to multiply that by minus 2 to put it in your homework assignment, as usual. And then it has this thing. And I don't know how commonly this is reported in Stata Output because I don't usually pay attention. The letters OIM in front of standard error. Are you guys used to seeing that, Stata folks? Nope. What that means is it's using the observed information matrix as opposed to something else. That's the default. So these are just the regular flavor standard errors. You can ask for other kinds like robust or cluster corrected, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but just it's helping label those. Coefficient means that you are in the linked metric. So these are log count coefficients. So the intercept for this model is the predicted log count when all the predictors are zero. And then we have the conditional uh, main effect of neutral, but then the conditional simple effects of all of these other things. Uh, SAS code looks exactly the same with the addition of log link and Poisson distribution, and also adding in EXP to get the exponentiated version of each of the simple effects, as well as the simple effect interaction contrasts. Here's the same 4.66 in terms of absolute dis distribution fit. And it looks like things are going much better now. But how do we know if this is good enough? Well, the answer is right here. Nope. Poisson is better than normal, it looks like. It fits better, but it's not good enough. So there are two ways we could go from here to try and make it better. I'm going to show you each of them. Go back to the original picture. And then we'll go. So this picture is characterized by two things, an excess of zeros and a positively skewed tail. Either one of those things can break the Poisson. You can either say it's Poisson, but there's more zeros than there's supposed to be, and I'll let there be more zeros. Or you can say it's Poisson, but there needs to be more variance in the tail. Both strategies are trying to fix the same sort of problem. So you can try to add just one of them, extra zeros or extra variance, or both. The one that we've talked about so far is saying, no, the zeros are fine. It's that the tail needs to have more variance to it, adding the K stretchy factor. And you know how easy that's going to be? One word. One. I sound like the count. One. Ha, 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 ha. One word. So this is where I'm switching back and forth. NB reg is negative binomial regression in Stata. I ran that because it explicitly gives you your alpha stretchy factor. That's K, by the way, not alpha. Alpha is something else. That one is taken. It's either coefficient alpha reliability or type 1 error rate or something, but alpha is taken. And it also gives you a likelihood ratio test, a model comparison, as to whether K is different than 0. And the answer is yes. And it uses a mixture distribution for that test. And in GLM, it's going to show up right here. N binomial instead of Poisson, and ML means estimate the K stretchy factor using the data place. Same thing in SAS, I switch out the word Poisson to Negbin. Everything else is exactly the same. And ta-da! Thank you, thank you. Pearson chi-square of 1.1. I win! <laughs> And it's real data, too. Do you know how exciting it is to win at real data? It's like the Olympics, okay? So yeah, so this, now we know we have a model we can believe in. This is what the model says the variance is supposed to be. The variance at any given predicted mean 
is equal to the predicted mean plus a stretchy that multiplies the mean squared. That's what the predicted variance is. So significant stretchy, as it were. Ta-da! Okay, questions before we adjourn? All right, then please do formative assessment number two in ICON and have a good weekend. Stay safe, stay warm.